He can hear you. It's not loud. Yeah, the last two people sound loud. How's lighting? Is lighting okay? Yeah, it's like. Okay, we can start anytime. Thanks. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zito Bartimus, I'm from the Department of Neurosurgery, and I'm sort of specialized in the problematic of the spine and spinal cord. And today I would like to present uh, on a very attractive and I think also very common problem, which is the herniation of the intervertebral disc. And I would like to structure this talk uh, from uh, basic anatomy, physiology, getting to aging degeneration and the, the clinical aspects of the intervertebral disc herniation with the emphasis on the problematic in the cervical, in the thoracic and lumbar spine. So uh, let me start with the objectives which I just uh, reviewed. So one more time, it's uh, in the first part the review of uh, some basic science about uh, the microscopic anatomy and embryology and physiology of the intervertebral disc. In the second part, it would be the description of the basic mechanism of intervertebral disc degeneration that leads to disc herniation. And the third part would be the clinical aspects and management of uh, these pathologies. So, let me start with a probe, which would be a couple of case presentations. First case is a 42-year-old male with a history of intermittent neck pain. One morning, this patient wakes up and has a shooting pain into his left arm. On examination, we see that he has a triceps muscle weakness, he has a hypoactive triceps reflex, and he has a sensory deficit that goes down to the third finger of the left arm. The diagnosis, based on clinical grounds, is a C7 radiculopathy, and the MRI imaging confirms that the patient has, at the level of the C6, C7 intervertebral disc, on the axial imaging, a very large this herniation that is almost completely occluding the intervertebral frame. In comparison, you see the intervertebral frame on this side, which is nice empty, with the nerve root localized inside. The second patient is a 72 years old male. This patient comes because he has a progressive difficulty to walk. In the morning when he stands up, he has stiffness in the lower extremities. And parallel to his uh, incapacity to walk longer distances, he has also decre uh, decreased dexterity of the hands. With the fingers, he cannot handle the spoon, the fork, and the knife, and he has difficulty picking up small objects from the table. On clinical examination, he has hyperactive reflexes in the upper and lower extremities. We could detect the bandit screw reflex. And examining the muscle tone, he has an increased muscle tone with anchor clones. The diagnosis neurologically points to a problematic in the cervical spine, and the diagnosis based on this symptomatology is cervical myelopathy. The imaging studies show that the patient has, at the level of the C3, C4 segment, a severe compression to the spinal cord, as you can see. If it's possible to distinguish on this imaging with the camera, there is a hyper-intensity signal in the spinal cord <coughs> indicating intramedullary myomalacia or edema. And we can see the same pathological finding, first of all, the normal anatomy on axial imaging, the spinal cord, and the white signal, the hyper-intense signal on tissue imaging, the cerebrospinal fluid on a normal segment. And this is the segment of the patient where you can see the huge this herniation compressing the spinal cord, which is a completely deformed, has a completely deformed anatomy. The third patient is a 25-year-old male who has again a history of intermittent thoracic pain and difficulty to walk, <coughs> and has more problems uh, recently with uh, the initiation of urination, and he has urinary urgencies. On the upper extremities, his neurological exam is normal. But on the lower extremities, he has hyperactive temporal reflexes. And again, we detect spasticity, clones, and positive bobbins reflex in the lower extremities only. So, consequently, the neurology diagnosis is thoracic myopathy. And his imaging study reveals that he actually has 
and the rank of the thoracic spine, a posterior disc osteophyte complex compressing the spinal cord and causing severe spinal cord compromise. On this upper image is the normal anatomy with the spinal cord inside surrounded by the cerebrospinal fluid. And on this image, we see a significant deformation of the spinal cord due to the disc herniation. And lastly, is a 37-year-old male, I'm sorry, female, who in the past presented with intermittent back pain, but one day suddenly she developed irradiating pain into the right lower extremity. At that moment, the low back pain improved. On clinical examination, she presented with a positive straight leg or last leg sign anchor reflex on the right lower extremity both hypoactive. She had some loss of sensation on the lateral side of the right foot and she had weakness on foot flexion which was just very decent. We classified it as M4+. The diagnosis neurologically is a S1 radiculopathy on the right side and the corresponding imaging shows that the patient actually has a very large this herniation at the L5 S1 segment, which is well visualized on the axial imaging, where we see the fecal sac with the nerve roots and the large disc herniation compressing the emergence of the S1 nerve root. So, after this uh, prologue, let me ask the following question What is different in all these patients? I, in first sight, I think the answer is straightforward. The difference is in the clinical picture. First patient had C7 radiculopathy, the second had cervical myelopathy, the third patient had thoracic myelopathy, and the fourth patient had a S1 radiculopathy. But is there anything that is common in these patients? Yes, the common denominator here is that all patients had intervertebral disc herniation, which is in very simple term said, piece of the intervertebral disc fragmented and compromising a neural structure that is adjacent to this fragment. So after this introduction, let me review some basic knowledge about the intervertebral disc. We have 24 intervertebral discs. And the reason being that we do not have a disc at the level of the C1, C2 segment. So we have six cervical, 12 thoracic, and five lumbar. And there might be one between the sacrum and the coccyx, which is variable. When the development of the intervertebral disc starts, it's very early. Like most of us, most of our organs, it starts at the third week of fetal life. I would like to show you on these pictures one important structure. And the structure is here. It's called the paraxial mesoderm. So you see that the, the paraxial mesoderm is located just next to the notochord. And with further segmentation, it develops into the structure which is called somite. So the somite are progressively developing segmentations of the paraxial mesoderm, and the somites are the principal origins of the vertebral column, vertebral, uh, the vertebrae and the intervertebral discs. The process leading to these structures is called resegmentation. So let me show how this works. We have here the respective somites that are blue. And during further hours and days of development, the somite start to segment with the caudal part of this somite will join with the cranial part of this somite and create a basis for a vertebra. This process goes on into the whole paraxial mesoderm and the vertebrae are so developed from the fusion of two adjacent somites. And 
In conclusion, the intervertebral discs originate in the line of segmentation of the respective somites. So the basis of the embryology of the intervertebral disc is the notochord and the paralaxial mesoderm. The structure of the intervertebral disc. There are three principal parts. First is the nucleus pulposus. Second part is the angiosphibrosus. And the third is the cartilaginous end plate. I mentioned the cartilaginous end plate at the end because this is the least acknowledged, in everyday life at least, acknowledged structure composite of the intervertebral disc, even if it seems like it has one of the most important functions in its nutrition. I will mention this later on. So let's start with some microscopic anatomy. As you can see, this large picture is actually the enlargement of this part of the intervertebral disc, where we can see the vertebrae, we can see the posterior part of the intervertebral disc, then the nucleus pulposus, the endless fibrosus, and the fibrocartilaginous end plate that is linking these structures to the subchondral bone or to the otherwise uh, vertebral body. This part here is the posterior longitudinal ligament and it's very nice depicted here how the fibers of the posterior longitudinal ligament enter on one side into the annulus fibrosus but also into the cartilaginous end plate fixing the whole structure in one very stiff but functionally mobile segment. Further description of these three components of the intervertebral disc is the following, just very briefly. The annulus fibrosus is mostly composed by strong rope-like collagen fibers, contains between 60 to 70 percent of water, some proteoglycans, and our cells are mostly fibroblasts. The nucleus pulposus is much more watery. It contains up to 90% of water, especially in the young. The collagen is type 2. The proteoglycans and the cells are approximately of the same type. And here we have the cartilaginous end plate that, as I mentioned earlier, has the fibrocartilaginous part that is adjacent to the intervertebral disc and the highly cartilage that is next to the vertebral body. The annulus fibrosus has a very interesting structure. Actually, it's a lamellar structure. As we can see on this picture, the annulus fibrosus is composed by approximately 20 laminae in its lateral and anterior part, and only about 12 to 15 in its posterior part. In other words, the posterior part of the annulus fibrosus is less strong predisposing the herniation of the fragmented disc material posteriorly towards the nerve roots or spinal cord. So here already from physiology we see the consequences into the everyday clinical life. Moreover, the interesting structure here is that all the lamellae are composed of horizontal <coughs> fibers of a rope-like collagen that have a physiological function in restricting movement into flexion extension but also in rotation. The nucleus pulposus, as we said, is a very highly hydrated structure, so in theory, as we know, liquids are resistant to compression, so a well hydrated intervertebral disc is resistant to compression and serves in the mobile segment of the vertebra a very important function in the mobility of uh, the segment. It's, uh, as we said, a different type of collagen with a high content of proteoglycans that attract water. The cartilaginous end plate, in a microscopic view, is localized here. This is the bone, and this is the intervertebral disc. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that I will repeat in a couple of next slides as well. The very eosinophilic staining is bone, but you see all these bone marrow channels that are continuing towards the fibrocartilaginous end plate. And these channels actually constitute a communication 
between the vessels of the bone marrow and the avascular intervertebral disc. That's why one of the most important functions of the cartilaginous end plate is the nutrition of the intervertebral disc. A couple of words about this because nutrition of the disc is directly linked to phenomena as aging and degeneration of the intervertebral disc. So, perinatally, the disc, the intervertebral disc is a highly vascular structure. By age two already, the blood vessels start to disappear, especially from annulus fibrosus and mucous mucosus, but by the age of 12, 16, the blood vessels are completely gone from the disc and even from the cartilages and plate. So in adults, the intervertebral disc is the largest avascular structure of the body. Its nutrition is exclusively through diffusion. Diffusion of nutrients from the vertebral body through the end plate to the disc. Very briefly, good nutrition of the intervertebral disc means that the cells of the intervertebral disc, which are mostly fibroblast, but also some remnants of the notochord, are able to produce the basic matrix constituents, which are, in this case, the collagen and proteoglycans. As you know, the proteoglycans are very complex, large molecules, composed by protein, whole protein structures as well as hyaluron molecules that link uh, the branching polysaccharide molecules and are negatively charged. So the proteoglycans have a very high affinity to attract sodium with water. That's why good nutrition means good proteoglycan or sufficient proteoglycan synthesis and this leads to sufficient and good hydration. And here comes the question, what is the consequence of a progressive decline of this sort of perfect nutrition to the uh, intervertebral disc? And we are, here we are opening the next uh, large chapter, which is aging and degeneration. And I didn't know how to exactly present the problem and the, the confusion between these two terms, so I just wanted to tell you that the differentiation between aging and degeneration is the same like the differentiation between black and white on this uh, sort of very, very fluid transition. In other words, we do not know, and we use the two terms interchangeably, and we probably call degeneration in a patient who is symptomatic from back pain, degenerative uh, uh, intervertebral discrimination, and we call it aging in an asymptomatic patient. A couple of words later. Nevertheless, in my talk now, I'm not going to use the word aging, even if it could be applied to a person who is asymptomatic, and I will use only the term degeneration. So, degeneration, very, very simplified, would mean dehydration. As I said previously, the vasculature of the intervertebral is completely set years by the beginning of the puberty, 1216, and the progressive loss of water, the progressive uh, decrease synthesis of proteoglycans due to cell death leads to desiccation, the occurrence of tears that can be radial or circumferential, the fragmentation of the disc, the decrease of the height of the intervertebral disc, consequently the fragmentation of the end plate, and sclerotization of the subchondral bone. Symbolically, we could say that a young, well-hydrated intervertebral disc resembles this rice field that is excellently hydrated, and the aging or degenerative intervertebral disc is actually something like this. In a <coughs> flow chart, the summary of degeneration of the intervertebral disc goes like the following. The theory says that the whole process starts after the obliteration of vasculature when the vertebral end plates start being more and more calcified, fissures appear and the permeability of the end plates decreases. This leads to decreased diffusion of nutrition to the endurous fibrosis and post cells. 
which consequently leads to decreased proteosynthesis, proto-glycosynthesis, disruption and breakdown of these constituents of the matrix, fissuring of the endos fibrosus, and sequestration of the nucleus pulposus. Very in large categories, we could say that this could lead to discogenic low back pain, facet-joint degeneration, which again consequently could lead to instability or low back pain, and the theme of our talk today, disc herniation. Let's concentrate on disc herniation. Why? So disc herniation, as I said, is a consequence of disc degeneration. So why? This degeneration in some patients occur earlier and faster than the others. I mentioned that degeneration equals to aging, but we see it in everyday practice that it's not the same. We have very young adults who have very advanced degenerative changes on their spine, and we have patients who just came for a follow-up, they are 80 years old, and their spine could be published in another anatomy textbook. Why is this variation? And there are two ongoing hypotheses. One is older than the other. This is original theory, which is called the injury <coughs> theory to the intervertebral disc, and it says that the wear and tear from mechanical insults yet to be identified, but some of them are known, like vibrations, are the principal cause of intervertebral disc degeneration. More and more data are now collected, especially from the Finland twin studies, showing that there are very strong congenital and hereditary factors, and actually 34 to 61% of predisposition is genetic for intervertebral disc degeneration. So I was talking about the disc degeneration which can lead to herniation. The question here is the ultimate question, why intervertebral disc herniation occurs? So far, our answer is this. Intervertebral disc herniation is a random event. Actually, there is no determined provocating factor because we have patients who just wake up in the middle of the night with a new shooting pain in their arm or leg and it's well known that morning disc herniations are frequently described by patients or they lift 100 pounds and between these two extremes there is everything. It has large consequences uh, from uh, for, 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 for legislative purposes, if we have to testify for a car accident where the patient had pre-existing degenerative disc disease and disc herniation, is involved in a car accident and has a new disc herniation, is it caused by the car accident or it's his disease? And it's, it, it's, it's, it's still a problem and also uh, this controversy is uh, you know, room for, for the legislative uh, we know. So what I wanted to say is that intervertebral disc herniation is a random event. This slide only shows that uh, there is a continuum of intervertebral disc herniations which was sort of classified by the International Society for the Study of the Lumbar Spine, ranging from sort of bulging, going through protrusions to extrusions, and these terms are ill-identified and that's why very often used interchangeably. I think that we can just concentrate on the three principles. Either it's normal, or there is a merging, or there is a sequestration. And sequestration means that the piece of this material is outside of the content of the intervertebral disc in the spinal canal and causing neurological compromise. Now, the clinical aspects of intervertebral discrimination. Cervical spine. On this picture, I want you to show the following. This is the spinal cord. This is dorsal. This is ventral. This is the vertebral body with the intervertebral disc. This is the nerve root that is uh, coming through the intervertebral foramen, joining the spinal nerve, etc. When there is degeneration, fragmentation, and ultimately herniation of a fragment from the intervertebral disc here, the intervertebral disc fragment can go in two directions. One is the direction mostly posterior or nozzle, when it would cause compression to the spinal cord and so myopathy. 
And the second possibility that it will go more lateral towards the direction of the foramen and cause compression to the nerve root, so consequently cause radiculopathy. So in the cervical spine, we have these two big entities. And that's why my uh, prologue introduction actually presented these two patients. The patient with the C7 radiculopathy, for review of his imaging, C6, C7 discrimination and radiculopathy, arrives in two hours outpatient clinic and the question is what should be the management so to talk about management of any disease it's always very very useful to know the natural history of the disease what happens if you do nothing and actually there are some data on the natural history of the cervical intervertebral disc herniation that were published uh, actually in 1994 which is uh, 20 years ago I'm strong in mathematics <laughs> so, 21 patients were followed and uh, the authors found that in 5 patients there was a small decrease, 0 to 35% in the size of the herniation. In 6 patients there was a 35 to 75% decrease in the size. And in 10 patients, so half of the patients, the decrease in the size of the herniation was 75 to 100%. So the natural history shows that there is a significant healing to the intervertebral disc herniation. What is the basic knowledge behind the healing of the intervertebral disc herniation? So the accepted theory says that any herniation, as depicted here, is causing a reactive inflammation, reactive ingrowth of new vessels, which is new vascularization, the release of uh, all the cellular and molecular mechanism of the local inflammatory process, which consequently leads to the breakdown of the matrix, uh, formation of the granulation tissue, scar tissue formation, and the resolution of the disc herniation or the fragment in 6 to 12 months. But there are still certainly rooms to consider surgery and uh, studies that randomized patients between surgery and non-surgical treatment are the most useful in answering this question. So the first study randomized patients in between surgical management, application of physical therapy and application of the surgical color. And this study showed that surgery was much efficient in relieving the radicular pain in four months but in about more than a year, 16 months later, there was no difference between the three groups of patients regarding pain, muscle strength, and sensory loss. Time heals, in other words, but surgery heals faster, would be the message. This is just one example of uh, one of the possible treatment modalities for intervertebral disc herniation, which in this uh, situation is a prestige artificial disc for the patient uh, treated for this disease. So, in conclusion, cervical radiculopathy is a non-surgical disease, primary, because most of the patients improve with time. So the primary therapy should be pain management. And the indications for surgery is a neurological deficit in the distribution of the appropriate nerve root or intractable pain. Cervical myopathy. This is the second patient from the series. This is the patient where the intervertebral disc herniated directly posteriorly and caused compromise to the cervical spinal cord. Most of the time these patients come with a more chronic protracted uh, symptomatology and again the important question here is whether we can manage these patients conservatively. So what does the literature say if a patient like this shown on the picture came into our office and we suggested him just conservative management? So plenty of studies which I just review very fast, starting with Carl Robinson in 1956 and with Epstein in 1989, show that actually it's not a good idea not to operate somebody who has progressive loss of the capacity to walk and progressive loss in the dexterity of his hands. So patients with cervical myopathy 
actually has or have a natural history of progressive deficit which is sometimes episodic, sometimes continuous. So the natural history of this disease is certainly different from the radiculopathy and that's why the primary goal of the management is surgical decompression. And surgical decompression is much more efficient when the patient is younger, then the deficit is restricted to a certain segment, so unilateral deficit for example, and in those patients when the symptoms are shorter. So everything that is lost from the function of the spinal cord is sort of lost forever. And here I put for myself this, this uh, attention sign because, like in everything, here there is also a point of controversy. And this point of controversy was published by several very well documented papers of Kadanka who published a 3-year follow-up, 6-year and 10-year follow-up, if I remember correctly, but certainly 10-year follow-up recently of patients who had a similar picture that I showed you before, but they had very mild myopathy on one side, and on the other side, these patients had high surgery risk. So what these authors did, they just followed them on a regular basis, and they demonstrated that these patients actually did not worsen. So even if the consensus would be that this pathology is a surgical pathology. If a patient is a high-risk surgical patient and has a very mild symptomatology, it's not against the general practice to follow them clinically. So this is the yellow sign for me. The management, one of, again, the accepted possibilities is to remove the compressing this herniation. And again, one of the possibilities, because there are numerous, is fusion. As we can see, the bone graft here is immediately after surgery is still visible and one year, one year later there is a complete fusion of the operated segment which was the ultimate goal of the surgery. So, in summary, cervical myopathy is a surgical disease. Any loss of spinal cord function is principally irreversible. There is no age limit if the patient otherwise could tolerate surgery. And the principal goal of surgery, so this is the safe promise to the patient, is to stop the progression of the disease. Any improvement is sort of the, the cream of the cake, on the cake. Yes, sir. How involved is the surgery? So, meaning like, you know, how, kind of how good a candidate do you need to be to be able to have to tolerate the surgery? If we talk about the surgery, as I mentioned, uh, this one, this is about one to two hour surgery. So if the patient has, I mean, he, it's, 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 uh, he, he's in a supine position, it's a small incision on the neck, and uh, the blood loss is about 20 millimeters maximum. So if the patient does not have congestive heart failure, then, then most of the patients tell the surgery very well. Yeah. So, so that's, that's really, you know, thank you, that's a good one. Thoracic discrimination. This is the thoracic spine, thoracic spinal cord, this is the back, this is the front, and this where the intervertebral disc could be located. And here, the 99% of intervertebral disc herniations have one direction only, and this direction is the direction of the spinal cord. That's why we have only one category to discuss here, which is thoracic myelopathy. So thoracic myelopathy was the diagnosis of a second or third patient that I presented, the young man who had progressive loss of the strength in the lower extremities, but normal exam in the upper extremities. This was his compression at the symptomatic level. This is the normal picture of a normal anatomical constellation. And the question here again is, what happens if we do nothing? Or what happens if we see a thoracic discrimination in an asymptomatic patient? So the natural history of this disease is the following. From 20 patients, where altogether 48 disc herniations in the thoracic spine were identified, during 26 months, all remained asymptomatic. And there was practically no change in the size of the intervertebral disc. So these facts give us a clue about that the disease is 
practically asymptomatic most of the time, and if there is any progression, it takes certainly longer than 26 months. And actually, yes. And the reason for this is, and I don't know the answer why, but the majority of the thoracic intervertebral disc, not all, but the majority, are largely calcified. Like on this patient, it's a different patient that we also operated. You can see a beautiful anatomy above and below, just this segment, where this degree of compression to the spinal cord occurs. And the patient was far from being paraplegic. If this herniation occurred accurately, the patient would have been paraplegic without any doubt. So the explanation of his still persistent neurological function, with spasticity, etc., but still capacity to ambulate in a limited fashion, is this. The majority of the discrimination is actually calcified. And this brings, uh, this answers the first question why in the 26 months period the authors did not find any change in size. And this brings us uh, to the second question how to manage these patients. So, conservative management in a symptomatic patient with this compressive pathology to the spinal cord is not <coughs> documented in the literature, so I would not recommend it. So, we have to turn to surgery. But as you can see, the spinal cord being distributed and flattened all around this disc herniation, the approach from the classical posterior way is practically impossible without damaging further the spinal cord because we cannot get from posterior. That's why most of the techniques are either more lateral or through the thorax. One of our patients was operated through a thoracotomy where actually this disc herniation, this is our patient that I mentioned, was decompressed, drilled off, and a segmental stabilization was applied, which is uh, facultative, not always obligatory. So, in conclusion, thoracic disc herniation is very rare. It's about 1 to percent of uh, all symptomatic disc herniations. The manifestation is by thoracic axial pain or progressive myelopathy in the lower extremities, with sparing of the upper extremities. And the indication for surgery is symptomatic spinal cord compression. No, th no thoracic axial pain. That shouldn't be operated. Lumbar. Lumbar disc herniations. On the pictures, I wanted to show the following. The disc with degenerative changes and fragmentations, and the piece of the intervertebral disc where the spinal that herniates and causes compression to the neural structure. Most of the time, the herniation is in the direction that is posterolateral. And we were talking about this at the very beginning when we said that the number of laminae of the annulus fibrosus is limited, 12 to 15, in comparison to 20 here. And there is another reason for this. Approximately here, we have the posterior longitudinal ligament. So that's why most of the disc herniations occur paramedian which is lateral to the posterior longitudinal ligament, but still posterior because of the difference of the strength of the endless fibrosis. And paramedian disc herniation causes pressure on that nerve root that is emerging below the segment uh, of, uh, below, below the pedicle of the caudal segment. So if this is L5S1 and this is a disc herniation of L5S1, this nerve root S1 nerve root will be compressed. And this is what we saw in our patient where the L5S1 disc herniation, visible here, was paramedian, visualized here, compressing the S1 nerve root and causing the S1 radical cut. And here we are back to the same question. What if we do nothing? What is the natural history of a lumbar disc herniation? And we see that in this uh, publication by Bosch from 1992, the percentage of intervertebral disc showing partial or complete resolution at one year was 76% in the herniated and less in the bulging, which make again physiological sense because the sequestration and fragment herniation causes much more reactive inflammation, so stronger mechanisms of resorption. But this is a very important message saying that about 76% of our patients will have a resorption of the intervertebral disc. 
this is an example. One of my patients, it's still, still from the period when I was fellow in Zurich, so the images are in German somewhere. But this shows the disc herniation here in the acute phase, and at three months follow up, the significant improvement on the patient was almost completely asymptomatic. There is practically nothing left from the pregnant. So, here comes the question. Does surgery have a role at all in the management of ectovertebral disc herniation? And there are quite recent uh, randomized studies by the group of Weinstein uh, and Paul. This is the publication result from the group from Weinstein, who said that patients with lumbar disc herniation causing sciatica improved substantially over the two-week period in both the operative and usual care group, which means physical therapy and pain management. So the first large study said, at two years, there is not much difference. The second group, as I said, is the Dutch Bowl group published in New England. They had a, a one-year follow-up study for the same question that the surgery is better than conservative management which showed that in both groups, the probability of perceived recovery after one year was 95%. So this shows that it's a good disease, patients improve, and they improve whether we operate them or treat them conservatively, but the rate of pain relief was faster in the surgical group. And we saw this already, this message for the cervical disc herniations when the surgery was still getting relief, providing relief faster than non-surgical management. And uh, Paul, the Dutch group continued the two-year follow-up where early surgery achieved more rapid relief of sciatica than the conservative management, but the outcomes at two years were similar. And this is an important message which was uh, published separately in the British Medical Journal that the fast recovery from sciatica makes early surgery likely to be cost-effective. I think it's an important message. To wait two years for somebody who cannot go back to work and is slow in very strong medication is certainly surgery is to be considered, especially in the fact that surgery is a safe method. So, in conclusion, lumbar disc herniation is primarily a non-surgical disease. As much as 95% of improvement occurs over one year with and without surgery, but surgery does lead to fast pain relief. So the indications for surgery would be again intractable pain or neurological deficit in the distribution of the nerve root or the development of the cordae carnis syndrome. So, general conclusions from the talk today. Number one, the primary management of intervertebral disc, disc herniation is conservative, whether it is in the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. Exception, when there is spinal cord compression that is symptomatic or other considerable neurological deficit, which means foot drop, cordial compression, the incapacity to urinate, etc. Number three, the most efficient treatment is time. Whatever we do otherwise, injections, steroids, uh, strong or weak painkillers, we gain time for the healing. So the most efficient therapeutic tool is time. And surgery is as effective as time, but is faster. And uh, as a message of the day, I would like to tell you that exercise is the most effective prevention of intervertebral species. Thank you for your attention. Very good, very good. Uh, any questions? Chico, any questions on your end? You might have to turn on the microphone. I think Dr. Fisher has a question. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, for a lot of these, it's like pain medicated management is an important part of it. Um, prefer it opioids, Tylenol, NSAIDs, um, TCAs. I reviewed the literature for low back pain, acute and uh, chronic non specific low back pain, and I think we can extrapolate those studies for this condition as well. Opioids are acceptable tool for the acute phase, which is approximately defined up to 90 days. For the chronic phase, opioids are, 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 are without benefit, 
and are leading to medicalization of the problem and all the side effects of opioids. So opioids actually are not recommended in the guidelines for the chronic uh, low back pain management. So I strongly consider avoiding opioids even in the acute phase, in the acute phase as well as possible. Any questions from the Greg? No? Okay. Well, no. Okay. Uh, thank, you. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, that will conclude uh, today's uh, grand round. Again, thank you so much for coming over, Doctor. We really appreciate it. And Dr. Fisher, thank you so much for, for trekking over here. Bye. Thank you.